Welcome to the Redeeming Halloween intro. This is going to be a precursor to the full Redeeming Halloween Masterclass. And in this brief session, we're going to be talking about can a believer participate in trick or treat? I don't know about you, but you might be one of those Christians who likes to hand out candy to kids on Halloween, but you get judged for it. And so I'd love to share a kingdom perspective with you on how to show up as an authentic believer who leverages the holiday of Halloween to be a blessing to your neighborhood without being cringy, religious, or awkward. And so in this, uh, this is a brief teaching. It's just meant to bring some freedom. It's not exhaustive by any means. You know, I could teach a couple of hours on this, but I'm going to try to keep it brief. It's not meant to answer all of the questions, but it is meant to give you a kingdom perspective through which you will have access to the answers uh, to all of the questions that I don't address today. And so this is what the format's going to look like. I'm going to be laying out my opinion, which is really an educated perspective. We're going to be talking about the origin of Halloween and specifically the custom of trick or treating. We're going to be talking about the opportunity that both the holiday of Halloween and the custom of trick-or-treating provide for the advancement of the kingdom. We'll address some of the objections, then we'll tag it with an overview, and I'll let you know what uh, resources are available moving forwards. So let's start with my opinion, Dub's opinion. And uh, again, this is an educated perspective. I've put a lot of time and effort into this, a lot of preparation, a lot of research. Uh, the first thing I want you to know about my opinion surrounding the ability to redeem the holiday of Halloween, uh, press it into the service of the advancement of the kingdom, and specifically the custom of trick or treating. I want you to know that my opinion is Christocentric. What is Christocentric? Well, centered around Christ, keeping Christ at the center and the focus of it all. And so a couple of things to be thinking about when, when something is Christocentric is who he is and what he has accomplished, and then who he is in you and what he would like to accomplish with you. You know, all of my theology began to change when I began to pray this prayer. God, I only want to believe what you believe about you. I only want to believe about me what you believe about me. And I only want to believe about the world what you believe about the world. And so even in preparing this teaching, I asked myself, uh, Jesus, what do you believe about trick or treating? Can a believer participate in the custom of trick or treating during the holiday of Halloween? And so... The number one thing that my opinion is built on this educated perspective is that it is Christocentric. It is scripturally sound. I'll be providing you with plenty of scripture as we go. Uh, it is kingdom focused. You know, Jesus said to seek first the kingdom. We are meant to represent the kingdom on earth and we're meant to advance the kingdom at every opportunity. And so that's behind this teaching as well. And lastly, you know, my opinion does not have to be yours. We can agree to disagree. I'm very much aware that I am not everybody's flavor. And so, uh, you know, there's a teacher out there for everybody. So please don't send me links to other people's teachings uh, that are, would be against this one. Listen, I've listened to John Ramirez. I've listened to Jenny Weaver. Listen, I'm, I'm well educated on the topic. And uh, so, listen, I've listened to them. It's just that we have some core fundamental differences in our belief systems and core theologies. And I'll be addressing some of those during the objection portion of this teaching. But this educated perspective is going to be Christocentric, scripturally sound, kingdom focused, and it does not have to be yours. Let's talk a little bit about the origin of Halloween. And I would like to say off the top that above all else, the origin of Halloween is unclear. I have watched hours of documentaries and read dozens of articles, and I don't even like to read, in preparation for this teaching. And listen, the number one thing that you will find consistently is a lot of contradiction surrounding the origin of Halloween. Uh, but there are a few things where there is some common consensus, and that would be that it is predominantly has its origin in pagan, uh, plus a blending of some Catholic uh, crossover, some Catholicism that has been thrown in. I want to make it very clear I am in no way anti-Catholic. I know some amazing kingdom Catholic people, and uh, so I will not be bashing Catholicism or Catholics in this teaching. So I just want to put that out there real quick. Uh, so if we look at this, uh, this predominantly pagan root system behind Halloween, okay, it's a crazy mashup of heathen belief systems and customs, primarily based on the Irish Celtic pagan holiday of Samhain. I know it's uh, spelt a little differently there, but it is indeed Samhain, which was about celebrating the harvest, warding off ghosts, and uh, the belief system that on this night of the year, the veil between dimensions, such as the physical and spiritual realm, were really thin. 
Now, what I love is that everything is redeemable, and we'll really be getting into that in a moment. But listen, celebrating harvest. How many of you know that Thanksgiving is a godly characteristic? And so they've just got the wrong targets. They may be thanking the wrong uh, entity or identity for uh, the celebration of the harvest, but this can be redeemed. We just need to let people know who is uh, the provider. Warding off ghosts. Listen, uh, how many of you know that perfect love casts out all fear? So if there is a fear of evil spirits, man, they just need an, a love encounter with the Holy Spirit. Uh, so why don't we provide that for them? And then don't even get me started on the veil between dimensions, between the physical realm and the spiritual realm being really thin because uh, they are so thin, my friends, that uh, you are the veil. You are the interaction, the interface between the physical realm and the spiritual realm. Heaven is looking to be released dimensionally through you. So even in the pagan origin roots, uh, there are things that people are, are dealing with that just need a kingdom answer. And so that's that's part of where I'm coming through. As far as the Catholic uh, Church belief system surrounding uh, this integration between Samhain and All Saints Day, uh, indeed, that is what has happened throughout history, that the Catholic Church took All Saints Day, which is the celebration of those who have gone on before that is supposed to take place on November 1st, and they just kind of blended these two together. And, uh, you know, All Saints Day is about honoring and understanding the cloud of witnesses and uh, a celebration of those who have gone on before. And I, I definitely want to honor the Catholic Church for being a better keeper of uh, the understanding of the cloud of witnesses and the saints uh, than the Protestant faiths have. And of course, I don't believe in praying to saints in order to get through to God. Uh, but, you know, we shouldn't be so harsh on people's belief systems because I don't know about you, but for a long time, I thought that I had to pray through Jesus in order to be heard by Father. And so we all probably have a little bit of uh, separation heresy going on in our belief systems. And so everybody can kind of relax about that. But, uh, you know, All Hallows Day, All Saints Day, the word Halloween comes from All Hallows Eve, the night before for the celebration of All Hallows Day or All Saints Day. And so uh, what would it look like if we began to redeem our understanding of Halloween back to uh, the celebration of the Cloud of Witnesses? I think that we can do that. But I digress. The point of this intro and this specific session is about trick-or-treating. And so the origins of trick-or-treating from the Celtic paganism side, trick or treating uh, started because people would expect that ghosts were going to show up and do mischief on that night. And then people began to play pranks on each other and do mischief on that night because they could blame it on the ghosts. And then they came up with kind of a old mob style pay for protection model where they would, you know, knock on the door and they would say, hey, I need you to give me a, a treat or else I'm going to play a trick on you. And so that's kind of the origin of that. And then the, the Catholicism aspect of the origin of trick or treating uh, was that the poor people would have the ability to knock on the doors and that they would say, hey, if you give me something to eat, then I will pray for your loved ones that have gone on before who may be stuck in purgatory. And so, again, that focus on the cloud of witnesses, those who have gone on before, et cetera. Now, the origin of trick or treat, uh, you know, both on the pagan side or the Catholicism side, uh, you know, those are interesting. How many of you know that neither of those origins are at play today when a little kid comes and knocks on your door on Halloween night? He's just looking to get some candy. She's just looking to get some candy. And so uh, what could we do with that opportunity if we weren't uh, taking a religious perspective towards it, of fear and hiding out and, you know, uh, you know, not wanting the sin cooties to get on us, you know, all of those things. We'll talk about that more here in a little bit. But uh, the main thing that I want you to catch about the origin of Halloween and even the uh, custom of trick or treating is that it's all redeemable. Listen, my friends, everything is redeemable. Redeeming things is about taking things back to their original intent. <laughs> and just as I talked about the three reasons that Samhain came into being, right? The celebration of harvest. Oh, well, celebration is good. Just needs to be targeted towards God. Fear of ghosts. All that needs to be replaced with the love of the Holy Ghost. And then, uh, you know, the last one, which was the, the, the thinness of the space between dimensions. Look, Jesus, uh, when the incarnation took place and divinity invaded humanity, uh, you know, the veil between the spiritual realm and the physical realm ended, and we are a part of that interface. In fact, we just need to redeem it, bring it back to its original intent. And I think a good argument for this is found with what Paul does in the midst of idol worship. 
And so in Acts chapter 17, we'll read verse 16 and then 22 through 25. It says, now, while Paul waited uh, for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship. So, so where was Paul at? He was walking through a temple full of idols. So he wasn't afraid of the darkness. He, he wasn't afraid of the idol cooties getting on him, right? Like he understood, oh, I'm a part of the kingdom of light and I'm showing up in this place. I'm looking for an opportunity to introduce people to God. And it says that as he walked through this temple, he's passing through and considering the objects of their worship. So he's looking at the idols and all of a sudden he comes upon an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him I proclaim to you. God, who made this world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives all life, breath, and all things. Come on. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing Paul walk through a, a temple full of idols, and he sees one for an unknown God, and he says, you know what? I'm just going to borrow that and introduce people to Jesus through it. So for people to say that you can't take something that has its origins from a, an unredeemed place and then redeem it and use it as an introduction uh, for people to the goodness of God. I don't know what you would say here to Paul. And, and think about it. If you put this in modern times, like if you went on a mission trip with your church and then, you know, uh, you said to the pastor, hey, we should go to the, the, the Hindu temple and then like just snag one of their idols and then introduce them to Jesus through it, right? Like, We'd be like, whoa, pump the brakes, probably, but here it is in scripture. So I believe everything is redeemable. <laughs> Every time is redeemable. Come on. I love it that Jesus' first miracle was making wine for drunk people at a party. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus' disciples had been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine, and he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. <laughs> These hammered people. Uh, but you have saved the best until now. And to, what is the context of now? When people have already had too much to drink. So Jesus makes wine in the setting of a group of people who are already drinking too much. That's a little bit awkward, but I'm just saying that's where Jesus showed up and did his first miracle. Verse 11, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So if we take this context of drinking wine at a wedding and Jesus shows up and he performs a, a multiplication miracle, what happens when little kids who are eating too much candy come to your door knocking on the door? Well, it's not so much about the candy that you're giving them that they're already eating too much of. It's how can they experience the goodness of God? What would happen if God showed up with a multiplication miracle while you were participating in trick or tw treat? <laughs> Twick or tweet. <laughs> and this is exactly what happened to some friends of mine. And I've blotted out their names on these screenshots so that the heresy hunters don't go hunt them down and, uh, you know, just gripe at them and stuff. But uh, you know, they posted on one of the one of the posts for School of Kingdom talking about this redeeming Halloween masterclass. And uh, these are my friends who said, we love the opportunity to be face to face with so many people in our community that we normally don't have contact with. We hand out lots of goodies with lots of love, smiles and laughter. We are the light. God is love and his love is tangible. Now, uh, oftentimes they will use my house to show up and do this because they live way out in the country and I live in a, in a good neighborhood. And so they'll come and they'll set up a big table in front of my house and hand out candy. So I knew about this story that I asked them about. Uh, you even experienced a multiplication miracle, if my memory serves me correctly, to which they replied with the testimony. Absolutely. 
Amazing, right in your front yard, total miracle. Uh, we were literally giving buckets of candy away, and we just kept having more and more. Kids and parents' faces were shocked when we kept telling them to take more, where they had been limited to one or two pieces elsewhere. Yes, very literally multiplied over and over, so much so we had leftovers that kept Cinda, my daughter, uh, in goodies for quite some time, I am sure. So much love and joy from our good, good father. And so, look, Jesus shows up in the context of adults drinking too much and performs a miracle uh, so that they might taste his goodness. And so when little kids come to my door who are eating too much candy, listen, they may be looking for more candy to eat, but they're going to have an experience with the goodness of God, the light, the laughter, the love of God. Listen, this is a kingdom perspective on this. All right. Everything is redeemable. Every time is redeemable. Listen, I'm not going to say that the Halloween is the devil's night or whatever. Like, give me a break. He doesn't own anything. He's an unemployed chump seeking employment in your thoughts. But listen, everything is redeemable. Every time is redeemable. Yes, even Halloween night, October 31st. And listen, different approaches are valid. You can have an overt approach to this, like a harvest festival or a trunk or treat at your church. That's awesome. Uh, but you can also have a covert approach. It doesn't have to be blatantly Jesus to do good. For those of you who don't know me, I operate a lot in the highest levels of government, and I meet with government officials, heads of state, presidents of different nations, and they bring me the issues that their nations are having. I just ask Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what is the strategy here? Because I know there's a heavenly solution for every earthly problem. When I get the strategy, I take that strategy, I pull out any of the Christianese words, any words that would make it hard for this government leader in front of me to receive this goodness of God and implement it for their people, uh, because my goal is to get the goodness of God into their hands, because it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. And so I call it the strategies of heaven delivered in the styles of the kings, all for the sake of the people. And so listen, truth is truth. It doesn't have to wear a Jesus t-shirt. Because truth isn't a thing, truth is the person of Jesus, and when you release truth into a situation, truth is going to do what truth does, which is make people free. So listen, just advance the kingdom on Halloween while kids are trick-or-treating. Do it overtly with Harvest Festival or Trunk or Treat. Do it covertly, just with kindness, with love, with blessing. Come on. And then, listen, you can have an overt short-term approach, and you can have a covert long-term approach. Listen, Daniel became the boss of the witches and warlocks of his time. The king that he was serving makes Daniel, listen, the boss of literal witches and warlocks in his time. And the result of that is that thousands of years later, when the Magi show up bringing gifts to finance Jesus's ministry, oh my goodness, where did the Magi come from? Oh, well, they were the wise men witches and the warlocks from Persia. Oh, they were the ones who were under, that came from those who learned from Daniel. And so Daniel had this long-term approach. Listen, if, if many if many of us said, hey, the Lord told me that I'm going to become a boss to the witches and the warlocks, right? Uh, then we would say, I don't think you heard from the Lord. <laughs> but Daniel, that was his assignment. And what was the fruit of that? The kingmakers of the earth, the magi showing up years later, in order to bless Jesus. So you can have a long-term evangelistic approach using covert models as well. The question is simply, how are you showing up as the goodness of God? Listen, this is the opportunity that we have on Halloween. We have the opportunity to be the light of the world. Listen, we're not the light of the church. We're not the light of our homes. We are the light of the world. If it's dark out there, we need to get out there. We need to interface with, we need to interact with, we need to make the goodness of God available to people. We need to shine the light. And listen, there's no battle between light and darkness. <laughs> oh my goodness. We'll touch more on that here in a minute. So you could do this overtly. Let's say you're trick-or-treating, uh, you know, participating in trick-or-treating at your house. So the kids are knocking on the doors. So, you know, open up the doors, give them the best candy on the block, and then just release a blessing over them, right? You could go with Numbers 6, 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Now, that might be a little much. What if you shorten it down a little bit to like, hey, God bless you guys. I promise you, if you believe that there is power and authority when you release a blessing on people, it's going to take effect. I've got a mentor that does this thing. It cracks me up because it really helps us see how we have a distorted perception of the kingdom of light and the system of darkness. 
And so I've seen him do this before where he'll show up someplace where he's going to speak and he'll have an old leather bound book. And he'll start by saying, you know, I was passing by this new age shop and I found this book of spells and I just want to read a couple to you. And you could feel everybody get so tense in the room. And they'll say, I'm not going to do that. Listen, this isn't even a book of spells. And then he says this, but why is it that there was so much faith in the room that if this had been a book of spells, and if I had read a phrase from it, that it would have released evil into the room that would have affected you. But when we open our Bibles and we read a scripture or a verse, the expectation for a powerful shift and change is not present on the same level. And I was like, dang, man, that's it right there. So listen, don't underestimate the power of a simple blessing. Hey, God bless you guys. Hmm, come on. Listen, you could operate covertly. You could partner with Holy Spirit as far as speaking to the identity of these kids. Look at their costumes and ask the Lord, why is it that their costumes look this way? Why did they pick this character, right? If a kid shows up with, uh, you know, the Hulk, right? Why did they pick that? Oh, because they're drawn towards power because God put that in them. They are made to be powerful uh, people upon the earth. So you could, oh, I love your costume. You're such a powerful dude right? Covertly, you are partnering with Holy Spirit speaking to the identity of that child. If it's like, you know, a homemade costume, but there's been a lot of thought put into it, it's super arts and craftsy or whatever. Oh, man, you are so creative. That costume is great. You're a creator. What are you doing? You're partnering with Holy Spirit to call the identity out of that child. If they went with a funny costume, oh, you're such a joy carrier. That's awesome. Come on, just Partner with Holy Spirit to speak to their identity covertly. You can be uh, be the light of the world and be uh, advancing the kingdom in that moment. All I'm trying to do is encourage people to rethink things and to take advantage of the invitation. Listen, the system of darkness and the kingdom of light are both after the same thing, your agreement, and they operate on the same principle of your invitation. So listen, if this is the one night a year where your neighbors are knocking on your door, expecting you to open it and for them to receive something from you, why are you not taking advantage of this opportunity? Listen, they may be knocking on the door expecting to receive some candy, but what if they receive some candy and a blessing? What if they receive some candy and a prophetic word, whether it's covert or overt? Like, come on, let's take advantage of the invitation, the oddity of this exchange of neighbors in a community on this one night, what would it look like if you show up and bring some Jesus into the mix? And of course, listen, we should be advancing the kingdom through this. Christ in you is the hope of glory. <laughs> so we have an opportunity to shift things by engaging in this. And again, this is my opinion, which is an educated perspective, and it doesn't have to be yours, but you know, this is for people who this will set free and help them to engage in kingdom advancement on Halloween night. All right, let's address the objections. So uh, most of the people that object to my perspective on this, they are coming from a uh, the mindset that we are at war with the darkness, that there is a battle going on. I just don't adhere to that at all. Colossians 2.15 says that having disarmed, past tense, the powers and authorities, he, Jesus, made a public spectacle of them. Some translations say made a mockery of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So where did Jesus make a mockery of and disarm powers and authorities? On the cross 2,000 years ago. Listen, my friends, we are not in a war. We simply show up to enforce the already victory of King Jesus. We inherited a victory, not a war. Jesus did not say it has begun on the cross. He said it is finished. So when we show up as the light, I've never seen a scuffle between light and darkness. I've never walked into a room, put my hand on the light switch and said, oh man, do I need to fast and pray before I hit this light? Switch? No, I just hit the light switch. The light comes on and the darkness leaves. So listen, I'm not at war with the darkness. I'm just showing up everywhere that I go as the light. And so a lot of people that will object to my perspective, it's because they think they're at war. And listen, listen, first of all, nowhere in scripture does it call you the army of God. The angels are the army of God. You are a part of the executive branch of the kingdom of God, of the government of God. You, you are an ambassador for Christ. You're not in the military. But Dub, what about the armor of God? Yes, that's a metaphor, right? Uh, we're also running a race, right? But we're not putting shoes on and tying our laces every day in the spirit, right? In order to run the race. It's a metaphor. And so listen, if you want more about that, we got resources on that. And again, this is a brief, not non-exhaustive uh, teaching on this, but 
just trying to help you out. So listen, it, a lot of people will, uh, not a lot, but some people would object to my perspective because they're saying, hey, now you're like, you're, you know, you're not giving the, what they would call the kingdom of darkness. It's due. I refuse to call it a kingdom of darkness because to have a kingdom, you have to have a king and Satan was dethroned at the cross. And so, um, uh, and, and the other, well, now you're partnering with the kingdom of darkness. I'm like, no, I've never seen light and darkness partner together. I'm showing up as the light. Uh, the second objection that often comes to this teaching would be, uh, well, you're just, you, you're operating in the fear of man. You just don't want your neighborhood, your community to think that you're weird. Listen, I could care less about the fear of man. I care about the love of God. First uh, John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. Listen, I am showing, I, I am not uh, participating in Halloween because I'm afraid of, that people might think I'm weird if I don't. I'm participating in Halloween and doing the trick or treat thing because I see it as an opportunity to show up as an encounter with the love of God uh, to the people in my community. Uh, the third objection that I hear sometimes oh, well, you're just trying to please the flesh, man. You're just giving into the flesh. And, you know, the people that voice that, uh, you know, uh, they, they have no understanding of the new creation reality. Listen, your old man is, isn't even around. You have no fallen nature anymore. You only have a new nature. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, are you in Christ, my friends? Then you are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So listen, I'm not indulging my flesh by participating in Halloween. No, no, no. I am pressing my body, which is a part of this new creation that I am. I am pressing my presence. I am pressing everything that I am into the service of King Jesus in order to, uh, to advance the kingdom in my neighborhood. So I'm not pleasing the flesh. I'm not uh, trying to satisfy the old man. My old man is dead and gone. I don't know about yours, but I'm not at war inside of myself. I'm showing up as a representative of Jesus. And then this is the big one, right? Well, if you if they knock on the door for trick or treat and you open the door, you are opening doors to the demonic. I'm like, again, we are giving the system of darkness way too much credit. You, you guys, you know, every once in a while, there's going to be something that goes around on Facebook, like don't watch the new this or that movie because it's a demonic portal and demons are going to tumble out into your living room. And I'm like, how come you never hear testimonies about angels tumbling out into your living room when you're watching The Shack or watching Chosen, right? Why do we have this weird thing? Like if you watch this show, that's a demonic portal. Well, where's the kingdom portals at? And how, how do we watch that? And how do we engage in that? Why is there all this fear on this side and nothing over here? I think that's a little bit crazy. And then check this out. Listen, how can you open a, a door to the demonic when you are the door through which the goodness of God, the person, the presence of the Holy Spirit invades every situation that you're in. You are a walking, talking, breathing encounter with the goodness of God. I love Psalm 24, seven, lift up your heads. O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Come on, you know, the weird thing about gates is that they don't have heads, because this verse is talking about you. You are the gate of heaven through which the goodness of God is looking to make an appearance on the scene when God defines his glory for himself. Moses says, God, will you show me your glory? God says, yep. And he hides Moses in the cleft of the rock, and he causes his goodness to pass before him. God defines his glory as his goodness. Come on, lift up your heads, O you gates. I'm talking to everybody who's listening to this right now. Be, uh, lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory, the king of goodness, shall come in. And what does the goodness of God do? Leads men to repentance, metanaeo, changing the way that they think. And so listen. When I participate in trick or treat, I'm not opening up doors to the demonic. No, they happen to be knocking on the door of the kingdom when they knock on my door. And they're about to have an encounter with a gate of heaven through which they're going to experience a taste of the goodness of God. They may be looking just to taste and see what kind of candy they're going to get, but they're going to get a to taste and see a little bit of Jesus as well. And so my main objection to these objections is that they are all religious in nature. Uh, you can always identify religion really quickly because the, the root of religion is fear and the fruit of religion is control. So all the teachings about don't participate in Halloween, don't participate in trick-or-treating, all of those teachings are based in fear 
and they are seeking to control your actions. But listen, the kingdom root is love and the kingdom fruit is freedom. So when I understand my true identity in Christ, when I understand that I am a gate of heaven myself, when I understand that I am the light of the world and I agree with and walk in and operate in all of those things, listen, that's the kingdom. That's my identity. I'm walking and showing up as love and I'm free to do that in every scenario. And so that, my friends, is kingdom. Again, this is just my opinion. It doesn't have to be yours. But in my opinion, kings redeem all the things. Come on, this is the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, when you only have a priest mindset, you're going to be super worried about you know things and trying to get alone in a quiet place. When you have a king mindset, you realize, oh, no, no, no. I'm showing up to take territory for King Jesus, to represent the nature and the ways of my king, and I'm going to redeem all the things. Come on. And uh, so it's my opinion. Kings redeem all the things. This is an underutilized opportunity for kingdom advancement. And my friends, this is just the beginning if you would like more resources like this, the Redeeming Halloween Masterclass is coming at the end of this month. You're going to have four nights, four different professors, four topics, four perspectives for just $44. We're going to be addressing this idea of the kingdom of darkness or dis spelling it, if you will. See what I did there? Because <laughs> there is no kingdom of darkness, my friends. Before the cross, Jesus references the ruler of this world. After the cross, prince of the air. He was demoted. Ruler of this world is a king over a territory. A prince lies in wait, hoping to inherit authority from a king. That's why he's running his mouth in your ears, because you are the kings of the earth under the King Jesus. He's the king of kings. That makes you a king. And so dispelling this myth of the kingdom of darkness, it's just a system of darkness. And uh, we're going to touch on witches get stitches. Come on, my buddy Brian Orm, he's going to be breaking down what it looks like to show up with love in order to minister to those who are trapped in the occult and even the pra practitioners of the occult. So really, it's not witches get stitches like in the old gangster context. No, it's about, it's about how can we show up as love in the life of those who are dabbling in or fully participating in the occult? Uh, how can we show up as an encounter with the love of Jesus that will heal their heart and lead them into the kingdom? Uh, Ryan Pena is going to be bringing some fire on deliver us from evil, just a kingdom perspective on understanding the demonic deliverance, all of those things. And then uh, we're going to end with really the true redemption of Halloween, All Hallows Eve, pointing to All Hallows Day, the understanding of the cloud of witnesses. We've entitled that teaching, I See Dead People. So if you'd like a kingdom perspective on understanding the cloud of witnesses and how to celebrate and honor those who have gone on before, listen, you're going to get all four of these teachings uh, with limited replay for just $44. Head over to redeeminghalloween.com to take advantage of that goodness. Again, that's redeeminghalloween.com. Hope you enjoyed this and uh, check out all things School of Kingdom in all the places. To the king.